no weird kind of me popping out of a cardboard box intro today. I tried to think of something for this one, but I feel like it's probably just better if I get into it. I mean, nobody really wants to hear me ramble at the beginning of a thing, right? Get over there! It's fine. Have you watched last week's episode yet? If not, make sure you go and click up there on the little eye thing. Click it. Click it. Today is episode two of our obsession with plastic. Where did we get to? Ah uh, yes, the luckiest idiot inventor in Victorian history had just accidentally figured out how to stabilize a bunch of melty rubber goo. I really hate that guy. Once the process to make vulcanized rubber had been patented and made widely available, the demand for rubber everything went literally through the roof. But the thing about naturally occurring products is that once you start using them up, there's not really an awful lot left to go around. And this is exactly what happened with the power rubber tree sap. Natural resources were reaching an all-time low, and so scientists knew that they had to figure out a way to reproduce this wonder material. But knowledge of chemical structure in the 1800s was pretty limited, and so chemists were essentially flying blind, hmm. sort of flinging stuff at beakers and, you know, hoping something good happened and stuff didn't explode everywhere. Note on chemistry here. The development of new materials and structures and compounds and things like pharmaceuticals relies heavily on naturally occurring products. And it also relies heavily on figuring out the structure of those naturally occurring products. Nowadays, chemists use shiny instruments to probe the structure of these naturally occurring products and then use really established organic chemistry reactions and rules and that kind of thing to piece the structure back together. But back in the 1800s, none of those shiny new instruments existed. And because of this, knowledge of chemical structure was severely limited. In fact, it took until 1922 for someone to figure out that plastic was made up of long chain polymers. Ah. And these polymers were entirely unlike anything anybody had ever come across. And so chemists were essentially flying blind. Vulcanized rubber was discovered entirely by accident. And after that, chemists kind of jumped on board and tried to figure out ways to make it better. One such chemist was a guy named Alexander Parks. Parks was born in 1813 in Birmingham in England and ended up growing up to be an actual chemist. Yay! <laughs> Somebody who sort of knows what they're doing. Ah. Parks was at the time better known for his studies into metallurgy, so the study of metals and materials and processes. And he actually has a process named after him called the Parks process. It basically is a method of getting silver out of lead ore. Also, apparently this was a century for naming things after yourself. As you'll see very, very soon, Parks was a really humble dude. He was super humble. Like, the most humble chemist ever. <laughs> like, I developed this thing. What are you going to name it? I'm going to name it after me! Uh. In 1841, Parks turned his attention to vulcanized rubber. But, like I said before, chemists' understanding of chemical structure in the 1800s was really limited, and so he was essentially just like flinging stuff at beakers and hoping something happened. Something, one day, did happen. One day, he was trying to recreate something called nitrocellulose. But nitrocellulose was a little bit tetchy. It was sort of explosive. And by sort of explosive, I mean hella explosive. And so Parks added an extra solvent to figure out a way to make it less tetchy. And he succeeded. In fact, Parks ended up creating the very first plastic material. And no, rubber is not plastic. You should go and check out my blog and have a look at why. Shameless plug, go and click the link. Plastics refer to things that can melt and then be reset and then melt and then set again. You see vulcanized rubber, when you heat it, it sets. And then when you heat it some more, it sets some more. It doesn't go back to the way it used to be. Alexander Parks looked at his material and thought, mm, this is gonna be important. I'm gonna name it after myself. And so he did. And he called it Parkasine. Like I said, super humble, super duper humble chemist. <laughs> Suddenly there was this massive rush to perfect and use Parkasine. But unfortunately, Alexander Parks was a much better scientist than he was businessman and he ended up going bankrupt pretty fast. But there were a whole bunch of people out there who looked at Parkasine, looked at the fact that you could shape it and mold it however you wanted to and thought, hmm, yes, this could be useful, but it does need some perfecting. But it wasn't 100% synthetic. 
it still relied on naturally occurring product. And these were both largely made completely by accident by chemists who didn't truly understand what it was that they were doing. And so replicating their work and making it better and improving upon it were really, really hard to do. In fact, we're going to skip ahead a little bit in our next episode, and by a little bit I mean 50 years or so? It's a long time. We're going to skip ahead to the very first 100% synthetic plastic material, Bakelite. If you enjoyed this episode, there are plenty more where that came from. Make sure you hit the like button, then hit the subscribe button, then hit the bell button next to it. There's lots of buttons for you to hit. I would love to get your feedback. Make sure you leave me some comments in the description box below, down here. I want to hear from you. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. You can also check out my blog for extras. There wasn't an extra last week, but there will be this week. I will be talking about what exactly is a plastic and how they're formed and what sort of categories you can have as well. Make sure you go and check it out and give me a follow and a like and a share.